Welcome, and thanks for coming out tonight. Um, you never know how many people are going to come out to these things. It's, uh, you know, it's a cold December night, a couple of weeks before holidays for some. It's a great crowd. It's a big, it's a busy, it's a big crowd. Um, it's, um, it, and that kind of warms my heart. It means people care. People are interested. You're showing that you care about our town, its future, and uh, it, it means the world to the commission who have worked, so, some of them, for a couple years on this project. Um, an informed electorate is the most desired, especially when we have a good story to tell. You know, an important part of democracy is the old adage, trust but verify. So we're going to, and you're here to verify tonight. Um, we're, um, we have a big story to tell. We think it's be, it will take about 60 minutes or so to bring, make this presentation. We could talk up here for four hours. We have so much detail. Who's, who's talking? No, sir, this is a public forum. We're going to make a 60-minute presentation so you know the questions to ask. And then, sir, you're out of order. We're making a presentation tonight. Yeah, I know you are. It's not a public hearing. Thank you, John. We're going to have a 60-minute uh, presentation. This is not a public hearing. This is a presentation by the task force. It was advertised that way, and that's how we're going to conduct our meeting, sir. You may have come here a little skeptical and critical. You may, you may, sir, I'm going to have to have you removed from the room, sir. Yes, you do. That's right. Anyway, let's get on with it, okay? Because the clock's running, John, okay? If I were in your seat, I'd be critical too. I have been critical of town projects. It's a committee's goal for you to hear the full proposal, all the details, so you understand the big picture and see that this plan is the most affordable plan that solves the problem and gives us flexibility in the future. I ask, if possible, to set your opinions and your biases aside for the next 60 minutes and listen and learn from the task force. The men and women who have worked so hard to find a solution to this problem of a permanent public safety facility have a story to tell you. In order to hear it, you must have an open mind. When we are done, we will welcome and expect many questions from the public. The anticipation of your questions made us work harder made us internally challenge the solution, and in the end made us confident that this proposed plan is what's best for East Lyme today and for the next, 60, uh, next 50 years plus. Some members of the task force have worked for almost two years, mostly independently or members of the police commission. Others are department heads who have institutional knowledge of the issues that plague our public safety departments and the need for a solution. We have con consulted with real estate agents, security experts, architects, other police departments, and more. I'll start the present today, t presentation today with a short history of where we are. This is not our first proposed public safety building. This issue has lingered as a problem for the town for the last 15 years. In 2004, Propo we, there was a proposal to build a joint facility with state and federal agencies at what is now Camp Niantic. Like any proposal, it wasn't perfect, but the $6.5 million plan was an affordable option that was rejected by the Board of Finance. The public never got a chance to vote. Needing a bigger space until the town acted on, the, uh, on a permanent police facility, the first selectman at the time, Wayne Frazier, moved the police department from what is now that small probate court in the town hall parking lot to the former CLMP warehouse on Main Street. 
At that time, it was serving as Dominion's Science Learning Center. We moved the police there as a temporary solution until another proposal could be forwarded. On the day we moved in, it was not an ac adequate police facility. It was a temporary facility meant to last two or three years until we found a permanent solution. With another change of town leadership in 2007, three years later, a new proposal was developed in a new location. A $14 million plan was designed to go on state land across from Brybrook Park. It was defeated twice at a town referendum. After those proposals were defeated, we took time out. We emerged during that rest period with, uh, with, a, with a, an obvious growing need to do something about our aging elementary schools. We thought the process was going to be in reverse. We thought we were going to have a police station and then years later solve the elementary school problem. But while the police issue lingered, we went to the schools. When deciding on our school project, this public safety complex was always part of the discussion. It was part of the plan. When I came into office four years ago, the plan for the schools was an $85 million build one new building behind Flanders School and build a build as new building uh, either at Lily B or at Niantic Center. We would have two elementary schools. That was the plan. $85 million went down to $65 million. It was a good plan, but it wasn't affordable considering the town had other needs, including this police station public safety facility. After months and years of considering our, our options, the plan was changed and the price tag was reduced to a $33 million plan after the state's reimbursement. This project is the last project the town will need for the next 20 years. That's an important fact to consider. Yes, we will need to invest in our infrastructure and maintain our buildings. Uh, we'll, they'll need updates, but we will not need schools, town services, public works, fire, EMS, anything for another 20 or 30 years. The police building has been on our capital plan and has always been part of the plan. It's now time for the rest of the presentation. Members of the task force will discuss our current facility, the immediate need for an update, the need for a facility uh, and a solution after considering all the options. We knew that this plan needed to be a solution that would last 50 years, not just solve it for today. And it must take into account the condition of our state's economy, the pressures of finances for families and retirees in our town, and the need to balance services with costs. I, I, I uh, would like to introduce to you Dan Price. He is the chairman of the Police Commission. Dan? Thanks, Mark. I'll cut my remarks in half so we move on quick. <laughs> um, it's been my pleasure to be the chair of the Police Commission for the last two years. Um, we've shepherded our department from a resident state trooper program to an independent police force. Um, from day one, one of the things our commission was designed to do was make sure that our police force has the things they need to do their job. Um, as Mark said, this building has been in the plan for some time, for since 2004, really. Um, we would be having this discussion whether we were still a resident state trooper plan or whether we were, as we are now, as an independent program. Um, so just keep that up as you go. I just really quickly wanted to introduce the, the committee that's been working on this. Everybody has been working very hard. We're all taxpayers. We're all... Um, nothing is a done deal. This, is, this was designed to get the information out. If we need five more of these, we'll schedule five more of these. This is not a one shot and done, John. So, so for right now, we have Tom Gardner, who is a former police commission member and a um, risk threat management expert. We have Mark Powers, former state senator and also a police commission member. Paul Cram, who's our video technical expert. Kevin Seary, Deputy First Selectman, Chief of Police Mike Finkelstein, Administrative Sergeant Mike Masick, Chris Taylor, the Fire Marshal, Anna, Anna Johnson, the um, Finance Director, and myself. So that said, we'll get it started with Tom Gardner and the condition of our current building. Thanks, Dan. I think the uh, first thing I want to do is thank everybody for coming out. 
it's my personal opinion that uh, everybody should be informed as much as possible so they can make an intelligent and logical decision on any project that the town puts forth. Uh, just a little bit about my background. I've been around East Lyme for about 50 years now. I served on the uh, Board of Finance in, as a chairman at one point, uh, as Dan said, on the police commission. Also was part of the uh, committee which recommended that we transition from the state program over to the independent police force. A little bit about my background, uh, 40 years in law enforcement, 21 with the Secret Service, another three years with Homeland Security, uh, 16 years in the private sector, the last 10 years with a multinational corporation out of New York City. Uh, primary responsibility, we had 150,000 employees who was working with the different business units in developing the uh, business continuity plan, or BCP, and my part of that was the crisis management portion of it. So I've had a lot of experience in... Um, threat risk assessment and uh, crisis management. And part of my uh, responsibility here in this particular project is to ensure this two primary focus areas was A, the safety of our employees and B, the operational effectiveness of the uh, public safety program. As Mark alluded to earlier, I spent about two years on the project now looking at all aspects of it and trying to finalize it in a conclusion to where everybody clearly understands the message that we like to uh, send to the uh, taxpayers and citizens of East Lyme. I think that the, um, the problem we have here right now, there's been lack of information given to everybody in the audience and others, and I think we want to solve that tonight. And as Mark said, if we need more, we should do that for the taxpayers so it's clear and, uh, and everybody has a clear understanding of exactly what the issues are. Without a doubt in my mind, the police activities are inherently dangerous. Uh, all over the world and all over the United States, there's many shootings going on. We hear about those, but we never hear about attacks on uh, police officers inside the buildings. Throughout the country, there's been many of them. Uh, I, can, I have three pages of them that I've read recently, and it, it just continues. The society has changed dramatically. I think that the, over the past two years, I'm able to get a good assessment of our current facility at 278 Main Street in Nyanic. And based upon my experience and expertise, I've come to the final conclusion. There is an unmistakable and clear picture of a town entity that is challenged on a daily basis to perform the basic mission, that is public safety. Based on the assessment process, which is very thorough, it is concluded that this facility bears all the characteristics of what we call a smoldering crisis, which must be addressed immediately. For those just a little clarification, there's a smoldering crisis and a crisis. Once you get into the crisis mode, everything changes. It's a whole different ballgame. And believe me when I tell you, you don't want to get into a crisis mode, whether it be this department or anything else. I've been involved in many, and they're not pleasant. They're actually very ugly. And what everybody thinks happens in those, you have a plan, the plan goes out the window because everything changes so rapidly. The town of East Lyme has a fiduciary responsibility, as any employer does, to provide the town employees with a safe, secure, and productive work environment. We don't do that by any stretch of the imagination. I've been to the facility many, many times, and believe me, it is not what we're supposed to be doing. The town should not dismiss or take lightly its exposure and liability that attaches by not providing a safe and secure work environment. You know, when you see something and you recognize that it's a deficiency, it's a threat, risk, or vulnerability, you can't unsee it. You can't make believe it doesn't happen or it doesn't exist. 
the truth of the matter is there's vulnerabilities, there's threats, there's risks in this particular environment they work in, meaning the, very specifically the building at 278 Main Street. Um, on the screen, you'll see some of the items uh, that we are faced with, or I should say the police are faced with on a daily basis. But basically, it affects the citizens they are trying to serve every day. I'll just highlight a couple of them. Um, first and foremost, it's my conclusion that the building is unsafe for police activities. The size of the building is about 7,500 square feet. They really need twice that in order to work in a building safely. And everybody says, well, it's not a problem now. It's never been a problem. And I've heard that story many times until something happens. Then when it does happen, the questions come very fast. The investigation, what happened, when did it happen, how did it happen? When did you know about the deficiency? I, for one, am not going to be standing by and say, well, I didn't know about it, and, but I do know about it. Everybody has to take ownership here. The, the building, uh, after 9-11, um, the president signed a presidential directive trying to identify all critical infrastructure buildings. FEMA come out with guidelines for, FEMA, uh, for critical infrastructure buildings. This building, built in 1930, which is 88 years old right now, nobody can believe that that has any critical structure whatsoever. The, the building is not staffed 64% of the time. It doesn't have a detention area. Some of the key aspects of it is lacking a safe and secure interview room for our police officers to interview people, whether it be a, a suspect or a victim. There's a non-compliance weapon storage area or an armory. That's problematic in itself. Police vehicles are parked in an unsecured area, which could lead to damage to the town assets, plus they need them for operational use. A couple of months ago in Portland, Oregon, somebody vandalized 20 of the vehicles and taken out of service. Um, I think in, in summation, I, th I think you get the drift of what I'm trying to tell you is from my professional 40 years doing crisis management and risk assessments, this by far is one of the worst conditions that I've seen. And I'm a taxpayer here. I've been here almost 50 years. I don't want anything to happen to anybody. I'll be very happy to get into it after the uh, other presentations and answer any questions you may have about the threat risk assessment process or the crisis management or what I, my observations and findings were. Thanks, Tommy. Um, Chief Fixon is going to come up and talk more about the current building and their working conditions. Good evening, and thank you for coming out. Um, I'm not going to go over everything that, that Mr. Gardner said. One of the things that we deal with on a daily basis in our, in our facility is really walking into work in a temporary facility that was never meant to be a police department. Operationally, there's a, a many, many laundry list really of deficiencies and inefficiencies that we have in that building and we deal with that from the police department standpoint on a daily basis which makes our job that much more difficult at the same time we have an infrastructure in that building that continues to fail you'll see a lot of the pictures and photos and videos that we have each and every time that there is a heavy rainstorm we have water that intrudes into the building well that causes many many issues first and foremost it's a health issue for the officers in that building because we constantly have water, water on the carpets, the ceilings, the walls. And also, if you see on the, on the right, the armory was flooded out uh, several weeks ago. We lost $5,000 worth of ammunition. And the problem is, is each and every time that we have these water intrusions, it's a different place. It goes from the walls to the ceilings to the floors. So each and every time, we're losing materials that we didn't know we were going to lose the last time. This is also in, in you know, really a danger to the records we have there. We've had officers have their desks, um, have water come down from the ceiling onto that. Well, that could be arrest paperwork, could be personal information, could be a lot of things that really have to be safeguarded. So, you know, in essence, the water in our facility is a crucial, crucial problem that we keep running into. As Mr. Gardner said, the building's also not staffed 64% of the time. 
And that's one of the conversations that, that the fire marshal and myself are, are having about consolidation. We right now have offices in three different parts of town. So for dispatch, we have dispatch in the northern part, we have prisoners that are held in Waterford, and we have the police department on Main Street. The problem is, is when everybody walks into the lobby of the police department after 6 p.m., there's no one there to greet them. So that lobby is locked. They go to the side door, have to pick up a phone to get a police officer. That's not the ideal conditions for a police department, and that's not what you should expect. Having the dispatch center inside of the police department, as every other police department has, allows that function to occur and not have a locked lobby that is not met by an individual, which there's, there's certainly a lot of dangers to that. In addition, the infrastructure inside of the building, the HVAC system is constantly failing. The generator has failed on numerous occasions, which when that happens, our computer systems, our record systems, our phone systems all go down. So all of these things lead to a, a building that right now is not sufficient for the mission that we are required by you as a taxpayers to provide. We talk a little bit about, I'm um, sorry, Another thing is the current location. It's in that two-mile zone for Millstone, which obviously is a problem because that first two-mile zone is what is immediately um, evacuated. So in that essence, the police department would have to be evacuated immediately should that happen. That's A2 is the entire zone, but that two-mile zone, as you see in that circle, is what has to go immediately. A little bit on the... Um, move to the next. No, the next one, Julie. going to the consolidation. Okay. Consolidation of agencies is crucial. I'll let the fire marshal speak on that. How you doing? Currently, uh, our EOC lies about 5.1 miles from Millstone. And our current position, talking about the, the new building, will be about 4.7 miles. There again, Chief Finkelstein talked about during an immediate need of any Millstone incident, the first thing we do is evacuate the two-mile radius. Is that a little closer? Currently, uh, is that better? All right. Currently, during any Millstone incident, we evacuate the two-mile mark. Currently, our piece of police department is within that two-mile mark. Being on the outskirt, being about 4.7 miles away, close to the D-line, it gives us a better protection. Uh, being able to integrate the fire marshal's office, the EOC, and the police department gives us more of a continuum of work. We're going to be sharing files, sharing common areas. You know, and right now, one of our other deficiencies is because of the dispatch center being off-site, our server and other information is networked back to the police department. So we have multiple points of failure in that system because that is not the ideal situation. The server that houses our information should be held in our building, but because the dispatch center is off-site, we're unable to do that. So again, there's a multitude of operational inefficiencies, structural inefficiencies, and infrastructure that really needs to be addressed and currently don't allow us to work the best way that we can. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Chris. <clears throat> so I think we've shown that the current building is, and that we could go on about the current building for quite some time. We're trying to keep it short so, so you all can ask your questions and whatnot. Um, no problem, John. Basically, how do, we, how do we come to the Honeywell building? Well, as the police commission, we have been looking at basically everything about the police department. It came to our attention that the Honeywell building possibly might become available. Um, over the course of 20 years, as, or 10 years, as Market said, we've looked at over 20 properties. None of them are perfect. Every property we're going to look at is going to be a compromise. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going to have everything everybody wants. Is the Honeywell building perfect? No, it's absolutely a compromise. But it has a lot of things that could actually translate well into a police department. It, the, the office space in it is practically ready to move in. It's got a built-in sally port. It's got a built-in armory. There's a lot of issues with the building itself that lend themselves to a police department. It also practically abuts to our town garage, which makes things a little bit easier there. Um, basically, what we're going to do now is go through the financial parts of the building as far as costs and whatnot. We're going to have Tom do, do the comparison between our current building and this building and bring out some of the good points about this building. And then we'll move on to the finance director and then we'll move on to questions.
want to start off by saying I'm adamantly opposed to any type of new construction. New construction. I think that trying to build a building out of the ground today is very, very expensive. It takes a lot of time, a lot of engineering, a lot of cost, and by the time you start something, by the time you end it, it's never what it's supposed to be. So far, the average is, uh, what I've seen is $516 a square foot for new construction. So looking at it from a cost perspective and operational efficiency, within the confines of the town of East Lyme, there's only one building that I've seen, and I've talked with many, many people about how well this building fits the particular need of a public safety complex. And I also want to clarify one thing. This is not a jail. We're not building a jail. We have no intention of building a jail. There's some holding cells. But the primary function of this building is to serve as a public safety complex for the police, for the dispatch center, for the emergency operations center, and the fire marshal. The standard today in 21st century public safety is to co-locate these agencies to make them more effective and more efficient. I was shocked when I went into the Honeywell building and saw the layout of the building from a renovation standpoint. Two-thirds, as Dan said, is already built out. We don't have to do anything there. The other one-third, which is on the first floor in the rear, it's 34, it's 30 feet by 180 feet, which we would use for developing for the uh, secure area of the facility. It's got one acre of paved parking. The, the building is, has a demising wall slab to slab, which, which we don't have to spend money for. It has a sally port, as Dan said to transfer, transport prisoners inside the building, shut the door down so there's be no, um, nobody can get out. I mean, there's, there's so many advantages to this particular building as compared to any other building in the town of East Lyme. You know, it's something that all of a sudden you say, we need this building, and there, it, there it was out of the ground already. If you look at the slide, present, it's on the screen right now, you see the, the comparison between the existing building and the Honeywell building. Again, shockingly, those things are already there. We're not paying for them. We don't have to build them. They already exist. I mentioned earlier in my presentation about critical infrastructure buildings. FEMA has identified as a Category 5 of what critical infrastructure buildings are, and this Honeywell building fits into that definition and criteria of a critical infrastructure building in its construction. It is not in the flood zone. It's 80 feet above sea level at where it's sitting. You need two, uh, two egress means. We have two. We're adding a third one that's going to go out to Capitol Drive. So from that perspective, operational perspective, it's critical that the EOC, the dispatch, and the police be co-located. When we have major incidents in town, all three of those agents interact together, make decisions for the betterment of East Lyme to protect people and property. Um, I think this slide is um, pretty self-explanatory. What was the taxes? Okay, let me answer that quickly and I'll take any questions after the presentations, but they pay 42,000 per year and they pay about an $8,000 for personal inventory, well, about $50,000 per year. Now, if you take the cost of the Honeywell building, which is six million, and you want to build one out of the ground, which is $15 million. The delta is $9 million. So if you take the $50,000 divided into the $9 million, it would take 180 years for the town of East Lyme to develop an ROI for that investment. Really quick, the slide up here right now is just some of the improvements that have been done to that building, so we won't have to be spending a lot of money on capital improvements on the actual structure of the building. That's fairly self-explanatory. Um, the chief's going to come up and talk about the location a little bit and some run times and some other aspects of the location, because that's been one of the big questions is, why there? And it seems far away. It seems like it's going to take longer to get everywhere. Chief will address that. And again, I'll keep this part fairly brief, because obviously there'll be questions about this. When you look at all police station projects, not just in Connecticut, but around the nation, one of the biggest questions that are asked are, where is it going to be located? Where is the best location for this? What's the most efficient location for this? And there's divergent opinions on that. In this situation, and I'll be the first to say, if you had the ideal situation where you, money was not an object, you would put it in your population center. Unfortunately, in this situation, I think we can all agree in this room, 
that money is an object, right? That's, I, I can't say for myself that it's not an object, and I don't think any of you can. So we have to look at what is economically feasible. So I was asked to look at this facility and look at, can this work? Looking at southern and southeastern Connecticut, there are four other police departments that are located within two miles of a border of another town, which means they're not centrally located. Others are fairly close to central, some are not. So that opinion basically leads, you know, in my opinion or, or my experience says that that isn't the crucial part of this because we have to be able to have officers that are on the road. Now, that's important because our officers are on patrol, be it the north patrol, the northern side of town, the western side of town, the southern side of town. They're out there and they get the call and they respond from the road most of the time. So in that case, the miles from the police department is not as large of an issue as some people seem to, to make that. Now, when you look at the town, you look at from the Honeywell building versus from downtown, there are many, many places in town that are closer from the Honeywell building than from the other one. But the other question that comes up is 95. And I hear this, I've heard this feedback and that's a, that's a crucial point because we cannot rely just on 95 as the only way to go if we were to move to Honeywell the only way to go to Flanders Four Corners or Boston Post Road. That can't be the case. So we have to look at other ways. But if you look at the town, you know that there's North Brybrook Road, there's Roxbury Road, there's other ways to get there. One thing that I've experienced in my time, only a year and a half here at the police department, is the police department currently is located 0.8 miles from Waterford. It's at the extreme southern end of the town. I have not seen one occasion where that location has hindered the response of officers, nor have I heard a complaint from the public about that location being not centralized, but being off to one side of town and to the southern side. So from that standpoint, if you look at the town, I don't believe that the location is going to have a significant factor or significant impact because there are many, many different ways to get from that location to other parts of town, as well as this location is closer mileage-wise to several parts of the community, right? And again, I'm sure there'll be questions about that after, so I'll wait for that. One concern that we keep hearing is the location and what it, what it does to the flooding map. Um, currently, if you guys can see the map up on the board, this is a map that we've taken off our town GIS system. It currently shows the 100-year floodplain and the 500-year floodplain. That is one of the reasons why we're building the access road to the Capitol Drive project uh, road, which will allow us another means of egress from that property. Thanks, Chris. Okay, now we're going to get into a little bit of how we came up with the costs of the $6 million. Um, Tom's going to explain some of other projects that we used as basis points. Um, again, from my time on the Board of Finance and being a, an accounting major, I look at the financial aspect very seriously and compare it to the cost of value proposition. What are we paying? What are we getting for value? So I did analysis of uh, any uh, projects within the state of Connecticut. I also went outside the state of Connecticut and looked at their project as well. And I, I, to me, personally, I think the numbers were shocking that the cost to build a building today, in most cases, averages $516 a square foot out of the ground. And I'm going to cite two examples of what I found when doing this research. Um, Newtown wanted to build a new building, 26,000 feet, and they started getting the architects involved and it was going to come in around... $20 million or plus. So they backed off of that and they said, well, let's get a, uh, another, an old building, renovate it. So they got this commercial building, 21,000 square feet in Newtown, added 4,500 square feet to it, and that project alone is 14.5. And it's not out of the ground. I mean, the, the construction has been finished. One other example I want to bring to you, point out, is in Bethel. They went to the taxpayers and wanted 14 million dollars. The town said no. I think that they went down to uh, thir um, 13.5. What happened is they went down to 13.5 and they started building a building and as of about a month ago there were a million dollars cost overrun. So now they're at 14.4 which is more than what the town approved in the first place at 14 million. But that's the problem going into building a building. The unknowns and the cost keep escalating. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm adamantly opposed to building any new building at $500 a square foot. That's today's dollars. 
And by the time you get it out of the ground, you're spending more money than when you first. So this six million dollars, in my mind, and based upon the financials that I've seen, is an incredible value for the taxpayers of this town. I think it's an unprecedented opportunity. I don't see that happening again based upon the uh, construction in this town. Sorry. Um, again, I did an analysis. Uh, again, in the corporate world, you do a cost-benefit analysis. You want to buy something, you want to do something. What's the cost? What's the benefit? And it has to be well documented. Here you can see there's a cost-benefit analysis of uh, the initial project that we're talking about, the Honeywood building costs us. Uh, the building itself is 2.775. With 3.225 renovations comes out to six million. That's the first option. Option two, if we wanted to build a building today at the uh, 25,000 square feet, it's $450 a square foot. It's going to cost us 11,250,000. If we waited five years, let's push this, kick this thing uh, down a road again. Uh, I've added one percent appreciation per year for five percent increase. And there again, uh, it's 11875 I, I think that uh, the cost to the taxpayers from today to a year or five years from today exceeds $5.875 million. I just can't buy into that, uh, spending an additional $6 million, basically, for something we already have here. And it's going to last us 50 years. We don't have to talk about this anymore. So from a tax perspective and a financial perspective, I, I'm not building any buildings, and we have something, and I think it's, to be honest with you, a gift to the town for us to be able to achieve something of this magnitude at this cost. I did want to point out one number on, can you go back one slide, Julie? Um, the estimated build out at 10750 a square foot the reason that's so low, and anybody who's in the contracting business will know that that's kind of low, it's because we don't have to renovate the entire building. A lot of the building is move-in ready. We're really only renovating a portion of it, um, maybe 20, 30 percent of it probably. So that's why that number is as low as it is. And it, it will be in that range. Um, now we're going to have Anna come up and give the impact on the town as far as the bonding, taxes, all, everything all you guys want to hear. Um. The town was assigned a double A credit rating with Standard & Poor's. Historically, East Lyme has gone to Moody's for ratings. However, in 2018, Moody's downgraded East Lyme from a double A2 to a double A3. The primary reason for this downgrade was fund balance or our savings account or rainy day fund um, because we were at the low end um, of that rating category. This came to light when the state budget was late in getting adopted and because of our reliance on state revenues in our budget. This did not just happen with East Lyme, though. Moody's reviewed all of their Connecticut credits and downgraded several. So at this time, um, we held a discussion with our financial advisor that, um, because we obviously did not really agree with Moody's opinion for our rating. And um, we determined that Standard & Poor's uses a more favorable criteria for cities and towns. And so we made the decision to change from going to Moody's for our ratings to going to Standard & Poor's. We made this decision to obtain the best possible rating for the town. Standard & Poor's double rating of AA is equivalent to our original AA2 with Moody's. Some of the criteria that Standard & Poor's uses for rating criteria are economy, management, budget performance, adequate budget flexibility, strong debt and contingent liabilities. In addition, ratios that Standard & Poor's uses to determine affordability are debt burden. And um, you can see from the chart up here that, um, uh, well, debt burden represents <clears throat> a percent of debt that relates to our um, full value grand list. And uh, um, they like to see that those ratios are below 3%. So um, this projects out for the next 10 years, which would be the period of time that we would be taking on the debt for the already approved in elementary schools, as well as for the proposed um, public safety facility. And then in addition, they also use 
debt service as a percent of expenditures. And, and the top grade for this piece of the rating would be that it's below 8%. And as you can see, um, for the next 10 years, um, these percentages would be below 8%. Um, based on, upon our analysis, we do not believe that the $6 million for this project would put us over the top. If everything else stays the same, based upon the criteria that S&P used, we do not believe this public safety facility would cause for us to have um, a downgrade in the future. Um, in June, at June 30th of 2017, our unassigned fund balance or our savings account was at $4.7 million or 6.92% of budget expenditures for that year. And as of 6-30-18, our estimated unassigned fund balance is $5.2 million, which or um, 8.5 of our budgeted expenditures. Um, last fiscal year, when um, we were faced with the potential of um, state cutbacks, both the town and the Board of Education, we put um, budget freezes on a lot of our accounts so that we would be sure to make it through um, without an operating deficit, and um, it, it worked out um, well for us. Um, each year, as part of the budget process, we update um, the town's capital improvement plan, and at the same time, we, we run pro forma debt projections to be mindful of the debt service impact on our annual budget. We strive each year to mitigate the year-to-year -year, um, budget impact, smoothing out debt service with incremental increases. With the already approved elementary school project, we are estimating that we'll eventually bond $34 million. And, um, We've already began to phase the bonding in. In um, the 17-18 fiscal year, we bonded 1,595,000 of this amount, and the debt service on that, um, the schools is represented um, with the light, uh, the light blue um, bar graph. So um, in 17-18, we added a little over $2 million um, in debt, which is the combined principal and interest payments. In the 18 and at the same time, um, that we're, we're phasing the debt in, we're also taking, uh, we're also retiring debt. So um, the blue line, the, the green line represents the amount of debt that we'll be paying off over the same period of time that we'll be phasing in um, debt service. And so uh, um, you can see um, the level of the blue lines. We'll be phasing debt in. We started in 1718, and um, the final year that we plan to issue debt for the elementary school projects is in the 21-22 fiscal year. If the public safety facility was approved, our plan is to phase the debt in in the 21-22 um, fiscal year and the 22-23 fiscal year, um, half of it in each of the two years. So the, um, and then at the same time, over all of these years, um, we will be retiring 27, close to $27.3 million of existing debt. So um, in summary, um, the next slide. Um, the schools um, will be um, adding on a total of $49.9 million in debt. If the public safety building were approved, that would be close to $9.2 million in debt addition. Well, at the same time, um, we would be retiring $27.3 million. So the net increase in debt would be $31.8 million. The debt service in our current fiscal year budget, 18-19, is $5.3 million. In reviewing the um, addition of the elementary school project and the proposed public safety facility um, in the year 24-25, that would be the um, uh, peak in our debt service, which would it, be, it would be at six point, close to $6.6 .6 million, um, an increase in debt of approximately $1.2 million, and at the, um, as of the 10-117 uh, grand list, this would be um, equate, equate to a 0.55 mil um, impact in, in the budget. Um, to um, put this into another form of perspective for you, um, the proposed public safety facility um, uh, over the average debt over the life of the, the period of debt, if your house was assessed at 100000 um, it would be $20.15 a year in taxes and so on. Um, we've done, done this out up to um, the level of 450000 
Um, this doesn't represent a tax increase, it just represents what it would cost you on an annual basis for um, debt service for the project. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, one of the other questions we get a lot is what are we going to do with the current building with the, that they're in if this does, does all get passed and we move them out? Uh, Mr. Powers is here to address that briefly. Uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, good evening, all, and thank you again for, for coming. As, um, as um, Mark and, and Dan, Mark mentioned briefly about the, uh, a little bit about the history of the, the use of the building, and it um, is a CLMP sort of staging area, and then uh, for Dominion's purposes, it had a, a public information center. Um, as, as Dan said, there were, um, amongst the many excellent questions that have been posed, throughout this process, uh, one of which is what happens to this building. We've had um, a number of meetings and uh, conversations with Dominion, and Dominion has, has uh, without uh, any specific agreements at this point, because obviously they would be premature before moving in, until, unless and until uh, this process is, uh, is approved and the, um, and the plan is approved, but Dominion um, has pledged to, to work closely with the town um, in coming up with a, a use for this building. It could, um, it could incorporate any, any number of things, but uh, as, as you all know from uh, your awareness of where the building is located, it's in a great spot, uh, not necessarily, as the chief said, as a police department, but as, as something else for economic development purposes. So uh, we, we would see, without, again, with, without um, any uh, specific agreements to date, uh, but we will be pursuing the idea of, of, of adding this to the, uh, to the tax rolls of the town. And um, as, as some of you know also, uh, there's some brownfield issues there too. Uh, the town has made some uh, preliminary inquiries and had some uh, good feedback on that also. So, uh, we're, we're pursuing it, uh, as I, I guess I would say, with, with some vigor, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, we've got to take the steps in, the, in, the, in their proper order. Uh, but we've been uh, very pleased with Dominion's willingness to, to work with us, and uh, we're, we're confident that we can come up with some um, excellent ideas uh, that we present to people um, when the, the time is right. So we're, we're excited about that possibility, and I think the... Um, I think the, uh, the, the future um, I, is going to be very bright for the use of that land if uh, this moves forward. Thanks, Mark. Um, so basically, that's what we have for you. Where do we go from here? Um, at this point, the East Line Police Commission is going to present something very similar to this to the Board of Selectmen. The Board of Selectmen gets to vote on it. If they approve it, we'll make the same presentation to the Board of Finance. Board of Finance has to approve it. At that point, it'll go to a town referendum. If we get a lot of questions and we feel we need to do another one of these to answer the questions and, and do it publicly so everybody can see it, we will schedule more of these. This is not just tonight only. Um, we are going to take questions right now. We are going to do an open house of the police building. If anybody wants to go through and see it, it's actually quite educational to go through there because most people just see the lobby, which has been modernized and looks great. But it, there's a big difference behind that locked door there. Um, so at this point, I want to open it up.